Corsair, our non-stimulant, thermogenic, and recomposition agent. Corsair is a super cool product because it's gonna help you utilize turning your white adipose tissue, which is for storage of fat, into brown adipose tissue, which is gonna help with energy production. So this is great to use for a competition prep or in your weight loss phase. So you can stack it with a, a stimulant-based thermogenic, or you could also use it in your off-season or muscle building phase to help keep you lean and mean. Corsair. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Pro Physique Code. Today is another fun episode. Miss Lexi has a great list of things that me, her, and Evan can discuss on the topic of, is it overrated? Is it underrated? Is it properly rated? And who is rating this stuff? Like, is there an official ranking system somewhere that we need there to know be. about? <laughs> I feel like we need the uh, these little like cardboard signs where we like hold up one every time I throw out a topic like overrated or underrated. That'd be fun. Deal or no That'd deal. be fun to yeah. do with like a whole panel of people, like right, like get yes. fifty people in a room and give them all a red and a green, and then see like yes. who thinks it's over, and then we could pick out you know, you know, it'd be fun someday. We'll do a live in person podcast. We'll have like an audience. Oh yeah, I would love that. I've seen a couple podcasts do that. Well, actually only one. And I think that would be like such a fun idea to yeah. do it live. Yeah. We'll do it live. We'll invite people in. We'll give away t-shirts and, you know, tempt them to actually come. Yeah. <laughs> um, but today's episode, we're going to start first off by saying thank you to our new sponsor. Now we're very blessed. You know, we get to work with the companies we want to work with that we actually believe in their products. So we're not out here shilling stuff just for, um, for the benefit of like money or anything like that. We, we literally get to work with the companies that either some of our athletes work with, or they reach out to us and we are already, you know, high on them. And so with that in mind, Lexi, why don't you tell us a little bit about cured nutrition? Yeah. So our newest, latest and greatest sponsor um, that we are really grateful for, for this podcast is cured nutrition. Um, so cured nutrition is actually a company I have been working with and using for about a year and a half now. So I really, have gotten to like use their products and see like see what I like. I, I've liked everything I've tried from them, but um, in particular, a couple products that stand out to me are I love 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 their Serenity gummies. And if you guys follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen me post a lot about them. Uh, but their their Serenity gummies are high on my list. They also have two really awesome sleep supplements. One in particular that helps with REM sleep, and then one in particular that helps more so with deep sleep. Um, those are their nice caps and then their zen product um and then also their newest product uh, well it's not necessarily new but they just reformulated it and it's something that i just um i just finished using my first bottle of it it's their aura and it is their gut and immunity supplement so it was really great to use um throughout the winter considering that's kind of that flu and sick season so they have a lot of great products um but my number one top pick is the Serenity Gummies, and that's I would recommend those for anybody. I take them. So just so you guys are aware, the Cured Nutrition products actually contain THC, which, if you're like me and you don't read the label, you might overly consume some of those Serenity Gummies. Oh, so, I yeah. remember that story. <laughs> yes, I remember you telling me. Actually, I remember it was at the yeah. Republic texas this past year you had said you had started eating them like they were candy and i mean hey i see that that's easy to do they do taste really good i was i was pretty shredded i think i had either just competed or i was about to compete and i ate a couple and they were good and i was thinking they were you know the, the kind that don't have thc the more cbd type product and then all of a sudden i started feeling a certain way and i had to text the raja and be like dude something's up and she's like how many did you eat and i told her and she's like that's way too many paul <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, the serving size is, I believe, two gummies. Um, yeah. Now, I know some people, I've had a couple friends who have tried them and they just do one and they're fine with one. It kind of depends like how, like what you want to get from them. Now, I yeah. think that probably the biggest thing I get asked about the Serenity gummies is people do see that it has a very, very small microdose of THC. So it's nothing crazy at all. But I think some people get scared by that if they're not used to. Well, I think if you take the recommended dose, you won't even notice it. But if you eat oh. handfuls, then you may notice it. <laughs> Don't eat the whole <laughs> bag like Paul. Yeah. So I take two. I take two usually right around like 6 p.m., a couple hours before, you know, I wind down and go to bed at night. And honestly, it's not like it makes you feel weird or anything. It just kind of helps. Like for me, it helps me to 
turn off my brain and to kind of just get more calm before going to bed. And I find that it helps me to just lay down and get drowsy. And so by the time I, you know, lay down to go to bed, I'm, I fall asleep pretty easily. It's just really funny. And Evan will concur with this, that growing up, if you did anything with, with marijuana, you were a stoner and you were wasting your life. And now it's literally a <laughs> method of everyone should be doing it. And it's just this weird shift of like, you could have gone to jail for what we're talking about right now. Like it's right, just right. Well, I don't know that I'll ever get over that. Well, last but not least, I will tell um you guys that the, if you are somebody who is like you can't take like microdose THC or CBD for work purposes, because I have had some clients right. you know, ask if Cured offers any products that don't have either one of those ingredients, and their one product that has absolutely none of that is going to be their Aura. So it's A R A U R A, and that's the gut health and immunity supplement um, that I was just talking about. So they just reformulated it, so it has absolutely no CBD and or THC. So that's their. If Perfect. you don't have either of those compounds, try out the Aura. Well, you know, Cured Nutrition has been around for many years. I've known the owner for many years, uh, just a lovely guy. And, you know, he's sponsored Lauren Conlon back when we used to do our podcast together, which Lauren and I have talked about getting on a podcast here again before too long. I'll have her on when I have my office set up. Um, and, you know, Diraj has been with them. So, you know, I just like supporting good companies and I'm glad that they're supporting us. And so it's it's just going to be a really cool partnership. The only thing we're we're missing now is an energy drink sponsor. So if you guys know somebody... <laughs> so that's the whole theory is like you take the energy drinks in the day and then you take your cured nutrition at night and you perfect, perfect. yes we'll get on that one we'll get it soon but mountain dew i'm i'm, I'm available <laughs> <laughs> well let's talk today because lexi you had a really cool list of of um we'll call them overrated underrated or things that are commonly perceived as you know things in prep you should do you shouldn't do you know Maybe they've been around for a long time. Maybe they were misunderstood. Um, and I think it's it's great to talk about them because these questions, no matter how many times you answer them, they seem to have be cyclical, right? Like a topic will become trendy. We'll talk it to death. Then it'll disappear for a year or two. And then someone will be like, you know, someone recently just said to me, hey, what do you think about this blood flow restriction? Have you heard of it? And I'm like, <laughs> heard of it. I was there when Jeremy Lenicky was getting his PhD in it 10 years ago and started the trend with Lane. Like, so yeah. it's just funny to me that some of the stuff just comes out of nowhere and it comes back and you're like, you know, now I'm kind of used to it, but that's mm. what some of these, like these topics end up being is like recycled fitness advice from the past. Absolutely. I will also say this too. I probably had four of my clients in check-ins this week say, I heard your podcast and I stopped doing apple cider vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And yeah, I think that th this list will be a good one. It's, you know, obviously, since we talk on Mondays more so about prep related things, these are going to be kind of more so related, I guess, to prep. But I think a lot of these things, I mean, if you're not a competitor, they could also relate to you as well. Yeah. So we're going to start with the first one, which is a heavy hitter. And that is going to be so we'll do what we did last time where I'll say the topic and then we can just kind of go around and say overrated, underrated, and then we'll dive into it. So first one is going to be carbs after dark. Evan, overrated or underrated? Overrated. Paul? Uh, I'm not even going to rate that one because I don't really count carbs. Up. Now, I will say this. If, if, you know, I have some clients that train at like four or five in the morning and they can't eat before they train, I'll actually suggest they have a really heavy carb meal before bed because that's basically their pre-workout. The digestive system at four or five in the morning just ain't ready. Um, so, and I don't honestly, I've tried it before. I, I tried eating before my early workouts. The problem was I was ravenous the rest of the day. I don't know what the mechanism is where you eat at five in the morning, then you train at six in the morning and I, you just like your hunger like signals are just on fire all day versus I, if I just eat after I feel normal. So yeah, I would say I don't I, carbs after dark is just a silly way to make people afraid of carbs. I don't, I don't, I don't know where it came uh, from. It's I know it's one of those. I don't necessarily know where it came from either, but if I had to rash, if I had to kind of rationalize, cause I think it's a very overrated kind of concept um but if i had to rationalize why it became a thing why people started saying oh carbs after dark are going to lead to like 
fat gain or you gain weight is, you know, if you are consuming a copious amount of food right before you go to bed, not just carbs, but just like food in general, um, you know, and you're laying down to go to bed at night, all that food is sitting in your stomach and it's going to probably digest really, really slow throughout the night. And therefore, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're probably still going to feel like you have some of that food in your stomach. Therefore, you may weigh in, weight may be up. And it's not that you necessarily gained weight or body fat, but it's just that, hey, you're still digesting your food from the night before. Um, and I know that's something that like, oh gosh, years ago, I used to be notorious for eating a lot before bed. And not only did it kind of disrupt my sleep, but you know, I'd wake up in the morning, feel like I was still digesting food from the night before. And it wasn't like the, a good feeling. It was just like a- right. I don't know, all that food sitting in your stomach and you just kind of feel like bleh, right? So if I had to rationalize as to why people started saying carbs after dark, it, you know, makes you gain weight, I would assume it probably had something to do with that. I, I think, think there, go ahead, Evan. I, I think it's probably due to the fact that most people that overeat, they don't overeat on fats necessarily unless you're eating a bunch of like chocolates or sweets and they're not going to overeat on protein. Most people will overeat on carbs. So I think it's almost more of a self-regulatory thing. Like, Hey, just eliminate this part from the end of your day. Cause most people at the end of the day, when they eat, it's out of boredom as <laughs> well with that. And, and sugar goes down real quick and easy when you're bored. So I think it would probably lead to overeating and a lot of people who don't really pay attention. So I guess the only really thought process I could go with it was it was a, a self-regulatory thing, kind of like intermittent fasting and all that stuff, which I'm sure. Well, and there there was for a while there a big movement of, you know, if you're not burning carbs, you're storing them as fat. But that's when people don't actually understand physiology very well. So like at the end of the day, we're less active. So carbohydrates are less beneficial for our movements throughout the day, our exercise, things like that. So where are the carbs going? They're getting stored as fat false your muscles can still absorb carbohydrates glycogen in the evening so you know if you've been training very hard throughout the day um your carbohydrate metabolism might be very high at night you might be like you know storing a lot of carbs in your muscles that muscle breakdown and recovery um yeah so i i've never i don't know i i just i grew up an athlete evan you grew up an athlete i never feared carbs but it became a thing at a certain point where carbs became the enemy and i think nighttime carbs and it makes logical sense to people that don't really understand they go i'm moving less if i avoid carbs and for some people it's it's an element of fasting right they go okay after 6 p.m i just don't eat carbs what does that leave protein so yeah you're probably gonna save yourself a few hundred maybe more calories by just skipping the carbs at night but i can just picture people like at 5 45 just shoveling because at 6 p.m. it becomes the devil, but so, at 5.45, so that so so goes down. Well, that kind of, I mean, that can segue into the next thing I had on the list, which was intermittent fasting, because that's something that I don't get it as much anymore, but I find that every once in a while I'll get, you know, somebody on a consult call and they'll tell me that they've intermittent, they've done intermittent fasting and it's worked really well for them. And I don't know, I have a couple of thoughts on this one. Um, now, I think if we're talking specifically for contest prep clients, intermittent fasting is very overrated. It is not something I recommend. Um, but intermittent fasting is also a bit of a loose term because it's kind of, some people classify it as, okay, you know, fasting for 12 hours and and having, or like, you know, there's, there's different um, eating, like, the eating cycles, I guess, with intermittent fasting. Well, there's but, a circadian rhythm, right? Like there's some, yeah. there's a, there's there, that, that is a thing. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I personally think intermittent fasting as far as like, just as a concept overall is very overrated. It's not like it's a, it's not a certain diet. It's just a dieting strategy. So you will. Right. Yeah. I, I actually, I'll look at it as actually kind of underrated with it because the way I define intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting can be defined as just a window of time you don't eat. Right. Um, and I am a big proponent of in prep having eating windows and eating at specific mm -hmm. times throughout the day. So your body can and look, life's not always perfect. Right. But if you can have an eating window and you can eat on a schedule each day, it's definitely not going to hurt you to do that. It also is going to give your digestive tract a break, um, which is going to make your morning weigh-ins more consistent. Like it, it helps with the consistency part of it. So I, I don't think an eating window of like two or three hours a day makes any sense at all. But um, I do think giving your body a break and giving giving it a, a chance to go back to baseline, your insulin sensitivity, everything, go back to normal, I think is beneficial for sure. Yeah, well, I I think that honestly, too, 
And I know some people aren't going to want to hear this, but I do see some people using intermittent fasting as a way to cover up most like binging at night. Oh, of right. Course. Um, so, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, my fasting window is I break my fast at, you know, 2 p.m. and then I eat till 8 p.m. But it's almost like they do that because they want to be able to cram in a ton of food in that small window and almost justify like overeating or binging. And you see this a lot of people who are really busy throughout the day with work and, you know, they get by with not eating a lot throughout the day because they're so occupied. And then they come home at night and they just want to like decompress and eat everything. And they kind of use intermittent fasting as almost like a just an excuse for doing so. So I see that being a big issue with intermittent fasting too, on top of just the fact that it is not optimal for digestion, depending on, you know, how how big your eating window is, but it's not going to be very optimal for digestion or muscle protein synthesis. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little neurotic about my sleep. And we all know in order to feel our best, build muscle, lose body fat, sleep is a big part of it. When I started incorporating cured nightcaps as part of my wind down routine, it truly changed the game in terms of having a good night's quality sleep and waking up feeling refreshed. The thing that makes the nightcap stand out isn't the already properly dosed CBD to help with general aches, discomfort, and mood, but it's the added CBN that takes this product to the next level. CBN supports your body's natural sleep rhythms throughout the night for deep restorative sleep that leaves you feeling ready to take on anything the next day. No grogginess or harsh side effects. I like to take these nightcaps with me when I'm traveling or if I'm experiencing higher stress than normal. Pairing the nightcaps with either Zen or a few drops of one of their CBD oils really hits the spot. Making sure to check out all of Cured's amazing products online. Use the code, all one word, for a discount at checkout. Yeah, I think Evan's point about meal timing is a big one because your body does adapt. Like you're, you're going to be hungriest at the times you normally eat. So you can actually start to regulate your energy throughout the day. And very few people are going to understand this because they've never actually been shredded. If you've done a bodybuilding competition and you've gotten your body fat to a point where hunger and energy levels start to intermingle, that's when really meal timing becomes important. Like you'll actually have a really good window post meal where you can, you can train harder and feel good. And you're going to have some windows throughout the day where your energy is going to dip and you can start to plan for that. Um, mm -hmm. And it, but that's when, like, I always say like the funnel of prep me meal timing becomes more and more important and meal composition becomes more and more important. The leaner and closer you get to stage, it's yep. going to have such a huge impact on your, your energy levels, your recovery, um, even your ability to focus and do work and things like that. So, you know, what's funny is last year, you know, the term intermittent fasting, really like the 16, eight is like the most common window, but in the research, a lot of it is like 24 hour, 24 hour on 24 hour off. That's really the more common fasting that I saw when I was looking up the research, but just by default, just by my normal daily routine, I was fasting 12 hours. I didn't intend to, but I was eating my last meal at six 30 or seven, going to bed at nine, getting up at five, doing my fasted cardio, doing some work, coming downstairs, eating at seven. I wasn't fasting. That was just my normal day. And I was having four meals, four large meals per day. That for me was the sweet spot. But I looked at it and I was like, holy crap, I'm literally not eating for between 11 and 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But I felt great all the time. So like, you know, somebody might be like, oh, that's the magic fasting window. No, that was for me with my kids, my work schedule, whatever. But 16, eight might work better for other people, but I always kind of think of fasting as a way it's a tool where people are like avoiding the work of being a little bit more diligent with their counting their macros. Cause I tried to do the 16, eight. I could not, I struggled to get all my calories in, in those eight hours. It just felt like that last meal was so forced. The first meal was great. I was starving, but that <laughs> last meal trying to get that in. And I just didn't see that. What's the difference between 16, eight and 12, 12 zero or you know not fasting at all you and know? if you're trying to get a lot of food in it's going to cause wreak havoc on your digestive tract too yeah. Oh, yeah yeah and that's and that's the other thing when you when you're when you're hungry when you eat the food's more enjoyable and you digest it better if you're eating on top of a meal you know that's just you know evan's tried to bulk before he's probably trying to do it right now like it's hard like you, you don't you stop enjoying eating yeah. i'd much rather diet 
<laughs> oh god uh, there is a sweet spot where dieting you're like this this is awesome yes, yeah it is. yeah it's kind of like weird when you're not dieting and you get used to just like feeling that level of fullness it's it sounds super weird but do you guys ever almost feel like guilty for like you feel like oh my god i'm i'm full like you oh, almost after prep after yeah prep, for like, sure. oh, should i feel like this like i've even had clients that are like i feel like satiated and full this is weird should i be feeling so i'm like no this is this is good this is good but you almost feel like a little bit of that guilt but um even on like some of my competitors the day before the show they're like coach like i'm i feel like i feel like something's wrong and i'm like are you sure it's just not the feeling of being full because we're really bringing the food up <laughs> and they're like you might be right yep yep yeah. also yep. i want to give a little quick psa this is uh, uh kind of on top of that but it's something i've run into a few times recently that i think might be helpful when food gets low on things and you're hungry slow down and eat your meal oh yeah please do don't don't slam that meal down fast that is a cause of more digestive issues than you can run into with that take your time chew your food digest it please i like that's a good note i've told yeah i think that also if you're very low in calories that's a great way to make your meals go a little bit like farther but it's also a great little hack too for people who struggle with overeating is just slowing down even like setting a timer on your phone or just making a, a, a you know making an effort to put down your utensil between bites but that's a good point yes okay so let's get into the next um topic so let's talk this is a I feel like this is a very very hot topic right now and that is going to be cold plunges and like sauna for recovery as an athlete Paul mountain and Dew, we're available what i said mountain dew we're available <laughs> i need an energy drink now i don't have one. Oh, evan's got a c4 <laughs> okay so cold plunges we'll start with cold plunging how do you guys feel about the whole cold plunge era because i feel like it is big nowadays wildly Physical. overrated agreed agreed for, yes for physically yes i can tell you that i have done it first thing in the morning and it does make me feel good all day yeah. does it I, impact I, my I body in a great I, way no but does it make me help mentally yeah yeah and i think you know evan and i come from a sports background i think there's a there's a purpose for it for high level sports for recovery for performance but for daily like you know influencer life it just seems like it's trendy because i don't know uh, it, it yeah. does seem like it so i don't know i know that there's a lot of i've seen some just some research you know more so recently about the fact that physically it doesn't do a ton for recovery but i could see how maybe mentally it could like like Evan said, it makes you feel really good the rest of the day or it can almost maybe help you to cope with stress a little bit better maybe but personally there is nothing i hate more than being cold and i cannot imagine willingly sit, like if you wanted to see me in a cold plunge you i mean that would be a show because i i did it recently and i'll tell you I, I did feel like almost like high for a few hours after there's definitely like a sympathetic response where your body it's almost like shock i didn't really love it though i went to the gym after and i was like i don't like this feeling um yeah. but but i'm sure you can use it to your benefit but yeah, I, doing I, it right before the gym doesn't sound like uh that might be a little hard. it was a few hours but okay but no my thing is is the problem i see like influencers saying like oh shivering helps you burn fat cells better and uh, I, i've been sh more shredded than just about anybody listening to this podcast and i never once sat in a cold tub um so i think a lot of these uh, these concepts that come from research they're 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 a little bit misguided because they're so focused on like a single aspect of fat loss. Like, yeah, maybe it has a very small impact, but no, you don't, you don't, you don't need it. If you enjoy it, good, go do it. If you want to join the polar bear club, cause you live in a cold place and you go jump in the water. Great. But all these people are just going to have these tubs at their house in a few years. And people are going to be like, why do you have a tub in your garage? Oh, I used to, I bought it for cold plunges. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not going to make you shredded. It's not going to help with that at all. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I personally, I feel like a lot of athletes use it because I think it helps with recovery. But I think that there's 
I personally think there's better things to do for for recovery. But it's funny because now that you mentioned, Paul, the polar bear club or whatever, it makes me think back to there was actually a thing when I lived in the Midwest growing up where we had a lake um, very close to our house. And there was a fundraiser every year during the middle of the winter where everybody everybody would run into the lake and like you'd have to like go in the lake and stay in there for a couple minutes. And it was just to raise money. But I I never did it because I like hate being cold. But it's funny how now people willingly do that in their their house. So yeah, I think it's overrated. What about um, a sauna for recovery? What do you guys think about like just sitting in the sauna for recovery? Overrated, underrated, kind of eh? I mean, there's different types of saunas, Mm -hmm. um, which is one thing to think about with that. Uh, in a grand scheme of things, they're overrated. I mean, they're not, not, none of these things are going to be a game changer with it. I think they have health benefits for sure, but um, is it is it needed or required? No, like by any means. Like Paul said, I've been more shredded than most anyone listening to this podcast, and I have sat in saunas a handful of times. Yeah, Same for me, thing. it's more of just a mental kind of recovery. I think. Uh, you know, because I do have a lot of clients who are like, hey, coach, if I sit in the sauna, does that count as cardio? I'm like, no. I mean, yeah, your heart rate might go up a little bit. That's just because you're getting dehydrated. But I think it's more of a end of the workout. You want to just decompress and sit in the, the sauna. I will say this. When you get shredded and you go sit in the sauna for 10 minutes and come out, that's when you take a picture. That's an incredible look. So it can be cool for that. And that's not nothing. I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, there's no value in that. Like at a certain point in prep, like you, you some confidence helps you, but it's such a temporary response to just losing a little subcutaneous water. Um, and a lot of influencers are aware of this and they take these pictures, you know, that's, you know, I've seen it done. So like, is it is it valuable for long-term health and well-being? No, I don't think so, but yeah, I, I think I, I think something too that's important for people to understand is I think one of the most overlooked part of prep is hydration with that and people not having enough sodium in their diet, not enough, especially not replenishing enough water after they've trained hard and after they've done their cardio. So let's say you've done all that, then you go sit in a sauna on top of that and sweat out. You got to make sure you hydrate yourself because if not, you are just going to run to heat hydration issues. I think that the two, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with sitting in the sauna, but I do think people, and I honestly, I feel like the people that think this are usually not competitors, but I feel like some people think like it's this miracle worker, but I have seen it can be a useful tool if like in the middle of the winter, if you live in, I don't know, North Dakota or just someplace that's really cold, um, Sometimes if you sit in that sauna for maybe 10 minutes before a lift, it can kind of help to get your body warm and make it a little bit easier to start your lift. Um, And I also find that if you, you know, when you're sweating, you're obviously sweating out water weight. So if you, let's say, oh, I don't know, maybe you had a really high sodium meal and the next day you're holding on to a ton of water weight and you're just really swollen, it may feel good to kind of sit in the sauna and sweat a little bit of that water weight out. But it's not like you're burning body fat you're just sweating out any type of maybe excess water weight that you have so well and also you know me and evan and lexi live in a sauna so maybe that's why our perception is skewed true yeah yeah that is very true very true it 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 can be helpful too for times when especially females are on their periods right that that can be a helpful benefit to things at times um Oh yeah, it has its benefits for sure. And I'm always yeah. one. I'd rather pull water out from under the skin than give somebody a diuretic in those scenarios because it's just much less predictable. Epsom yeah. salt baths and saunas are much more preferred um, at the end of prep for me if there is a water issue. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, cool. So moving right along to we're gonna get into a couple of like show related things. So tanning, sitting in a tanning bed before. A show. So before like you get your spray tan for a show, what are your guys' thoughts on having like a nice base layer and sitting in a tanning bed before you get your show day tan? Underrated. I'm going to say way underrated. Yeah, I think underrated, but I don't necessarily think well, because I hate to sit here and tell people to go lay in a tanning bed. Some people just don't want to do that. Personally, I just don't. I don't know. I I don't want to do it. I just... But I think having a good base layer of like pigmentation to your skin before getting that stage tan is very underrated. Yeah. yeah. I, so many- my first couple shows, I got a one month membership at a 
tanning salon. Now I'm a very, I get tanned very easily, but that for me was a problem because I didn't have an even tan all over. And so I didn't want to have uh, tan lines. So I got it to even my tan out, but I still look back at my first couple shows and think that's the best my tan ever looked. And it's not that I got super dark, but I was, I was micro dosing. I was literally going for five minutes at a time the first week and seven minutes. And, you know, I think by the last week I was going every other day for 10 or 12 minutes and I was doing all the stupid lotions and what it turned into for me was almost like a meditation. I got to like, you go in the booth, you put all the lotion on, you do, you put your music in, you set the timer. I would fall asleep for 10, 10, 12 minutes. And I, I started to learn to enjoy it where like Lexi, like you said, I didn't want to do it. I thought this is stupid. Um, I felt very weird, but by the end I was really enjoying these sessions. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's underrated and I, especially for men who have to wear really tiny trunks and we don't tend to wear those at the beach. You, how many times you go to a bodybuilding show and you you can see a guy's tan lines on his legs because I don't care how many layers of protein you put on, it's there's going to be a visible difference. And here's the deal when it comes to tanning too, when it comes to putting protein on. I think all of us who follow bodybuilding for a while know some guys specifically who are pale, like almost translucent skin, that they are grainy and look insane. It takes so many layers of tan on them to get them dark that it ends up muddying it. It ends up muddying the look. There's only so many coats of tan that you can put on before it starts almost looking thick and muddies it. So the more base tan you can have to begin with, typically the less coats it's going to be. And honestly, the 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 more even your uh, skin hydration is yep. going to be, which yep. means it's going to take up the tan that much better so if you have kind of like a farmer's tan where you have part of your body's tan a part of it's not that's going to absorb differently yeah yep. and that's actually a great point um that i want to bring up to specifically i guess this applies to males too but specifically females especially if you're competing in the summer months um you know, a lot of females like to lay out in the sun, sunbathe. Be careful if you're competing in the summer. Be careful mm -hmm. if you are laying out because the tanning companies do not like if you have really bad tan lines. It is really, I mean, they can do what they can to kind of cover that up. But that, I think that happened to me my first show ever. I had like a tan line from like, it just, it had lingered for so long, but the tanning lady wasn't super happy about that. So I always say, if you are a female and you are competing in the summer months and you want to be able to like still enjoy the you know be outdoors and, and in a bathing suit if i were you i would get like a posing suit from a suit company that has the same like coverage as your actual stage suit that way if you do get a little bit of a tan line it's not a big issue so but you just don't want to you know be wearing like one of those suits that has a top with like all these crisscrosses and then have this really wonky tan line and then go right. and try to get your stage tan because that is I mean like I said the tanning companies they do what they can but that you know you don't want something like that to potentially reflect when you get on stage yep yeah um okay so next thing is another show related question so or another show related topic getting your makeup professionally done at a show what do you guys think underrated overrated underrated for most people yeah i, I think underrated. the population of people that i work with it's very underrated um yeah i i'll, I'll say this when i start, started having a bunch of girls turn pro in 2017 2016 i didn't really understand why some of my girls would walk out on stage and look gorgeous and some would walk out on stage and i'd be like eh and it wasn't until I met a makeup artist that was like, oh, yeah, stage makeup. That was back in the era where there was not a lot of information about stage makeup. Um, and that's when I met. So I had three girls turn pro at one show, and they all used the same makeup artist in 2017. And that's when I met Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn posted. Um, and that's when I was like, okay, from now on, you know, I'm going to start recommending people. You know, now we have V and we have a bunch of makeup artists, Joey, and a bunch of people that we recommend um, because it is a game changer. If you if your makeup is off at a, at a show, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's going to hurt you. Yeah, yep. I think a lot of girls, I mean, I highly recommend getting your makeup professionally done, especially I think it's a no brainer. If you're a first time competitor, get it done. That way, you know, because LeBeau, I got a shout out LeBeau. She does a great job. I don't want to, yeah, I'm, LeBeau, I'm not trying to forget Lee, people. Yeah. Lee, Carolyn. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of great makeup artists out there. And, and also if you guys are listening and you ever 
need recommendations, like you can DM any of us and we can give you yeah. some references for that. But um, I, I think it's a very overrated, overrated thing. And I see that some girls, if they're a little hesitant to like, oh, I don't know, like, should I, I kind of want to do my own makeup. A lot of times I find that it's because they want to try and save money. But the way I look at it is you're not really going to save money by doing your own makeup, unless you're doing multiple shows, right? Because you're still going to have to buy all of that makeup to do your own makeup because stage makeup is not your just everyday makeup look. So you're probably going to have to invest a little bit of money and, you know, buying the products to do it yourself. So unless you're doing like three plus shows, you know, where you're going to be doing your own makeup, yes, maybe you save money that way. But if you're only going to do one or two shows, you're really probably not going to save that much money by doing your own makeup. And, you know, and I personally, I love getting my makeup professionally done. I think that's probably my favorite part of this. It is a glamorous feeling and you have an appointment and you go there. And as long as everything's running smooth, it's great. Um, If you are competing with high frequency, it it can become quite expensive. Um, So then, then, you know, I have some competitors that do their own makeup and they do such a good job. You would never know. And then some girls, they do it, they do it big with V at every show. And it's a part of their like show experience. They want that, that look. Um, So I think it's, especially for younger competitors underrated because there is just something to bringing out the beauty in a woman's face on stage that is challenging with those stage lights where the contouring has to be right. The lips and eyes are highlighted. And I always say like, if you don't look like, like some girls look prettier with no makeup on before the show than they do on stage with makeup. That's a problem. Yeah. 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 And the way, the way I look at it too is, is I'm not trying not to be mean here. Um, A lot of girls think they're really, really great with makeup and then it gets on stage. It's not necessarily translate with that, but let's say you are really good with makeup. Okay. Let's say you actually legitimately are good with it and you haven't competed before. Please get your makeup done professionally first. So you can see what it is that they do. And if you are good with makeup and you actually know what you're doing and you can recreate that look, then I think it's beneficial for you to do it on your own, especially as an NPC competitor, because some of those appointments are early in the morning, early, early, like 3.30 in the morning. So it just depends, right? All these are going to be, it depends. But for most people, get your makeup professionally done. If you've done a bunch of shows and you want to practice and you want to do put in the back work for that, Sure, but most people aren't going to do all that. Yeah, I think um, I've had a couple girls that have done their own makeup and it's actually, you know, it's ended up working out really well. And what I'll have them do before their show day is like well in advance, we'll do a trial run where, where they'll do their makeup and send me a picture. That way I can make sure it's, you know, everything is good. Um, but yeah, I think it's underrated for newer competitors and people who just maybe don't like doing their makeup or don't have a lot of experience doing their makeup. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Next thing. What do you guys think about going to nationals, going to a national level show just for fun? So just kind of going for, I guess, the experience. So I guess the way I interpret this is somebody who maybe thinks, okay, I'm probably not ready to go to nationals, but I'm qualified and I kind of just want to go for the experience. Mm. It's a tough one for me because it, yeah. it definitely comes down to the person. Like I have competitors who are they know they're not going to go there and be competitive but they want to experience the national stage and they have a good time i've also had girls that tell me i want to go to the national stage and experience it and they cry because they didn't get first call outs so it really comes down to getting to know the client i would probably say it's it's overrated because i would just rather you do another highly competitive npc show than go to nationals because nationals is not about the athlete nationals is very fast it's very almost you know robotic in nature especially the larger shows they're just getting you know two three hundred girls across the stage you're not your routines oftentimes at finals they don't even do routines these days you know literally at nationals they had the top five come out do a front post and that was it yeah it's definitely not not for the athlete there uh, I can tell you this, you are a, if you go to a national show, this is no disrespect to the people that work national shows. There are a lot of people at these shows and they have to handle a lot of yeah. people. It's like herding cats. It is hard. The Nobody judges are sitting there for 12 time. hours. It's so it's yes. not about the athlete at these shows. It's about no. getting the best person. Qualified. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's about, about getting the best person yeah. to turn pro. That's what the show is about. It's not for the experience. It's not for anything. Yeah. Right. And I mean, not to mention it's like, unless nationals, a national show is in your backyard, it is expensive. So Dream you have to ask yourself, okay, if you're just going for fun, here's the way I, what I would probably encourage somebody to do if they were nationally qualified and they knew, okay, I'm not going to stack up to the girls at the national level, but I still want to go for the experience. Right. I would say, well, why don't you just maybe just go and like go with your team or go and watch, right? That way you can still get the experience of being there. But I mean, I feel like even girls who say, oh, I, I, I want to go just for fun. I know I'm not going to have a chance. I feel like even girls that say that would end up going and probably be pretty hurt, you know, to place yeah. last, right? And then that doesn't do anything for your confidence. And so I just, uh, I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I, so I had a girl last year. She had won her class a couple times at shows in Texas, but I, I knew she wasn't going to be competitive to win a pro card. But she's like, coach, I'm retiring from competing and I'm starting a family next year. So I just want to experience nationals. Boom. We did it. She had a great time. We even stayed in touch right after prep, you know, um, and, and she had a great reverse experience, but that was a rare. I've also had the opposite. So yeah, it's for me, it's probably overrated. I love your idea, Lexi, go to nationals. You can almost get the same experience. You can even be, you know, near the backstage area. You can see the athletes warming up, you know, you can really take it all in without suiting up and getting on stage and spending don't forget nationals i think it's like 350 per class and then the makeup's going to be even harder to get there because all the best makeup artists are going to be filled and you're going to get them at 2 a.m tanning is going to be difficult um and then they're going to bring you out in groups they're going to bring you out individual real quick and then they're going to do call outs and you're going to be done and it goes so fast yeah. yeah, it's fun to, you know, like it, it's also fun to be a stage mom too. So if you want to go for the experience and you have a friend or a teammate competing, like go and just offer to be their kind of their, yeah. you know, their stage. If mom you're on our team and, team and you're at a national show and we have a sponsorship, we get a few backstage coaching passes. You want to come be a state. I love that. I love when there's a girl backstage that just helps, you know, there's, there's a lot going on on show day. It's such a fun experience. I love, like I call it being the stage mom. I love it because you don't have that like pressure of like being the competitor, but you still get to be, like you still get the somewhat. You did, it, you did it for me a couple of times last year. You were there yeah. for like an Olympia qualification. You were there. I think you were there when Brittany got her Olympia qualification. Yeah. You've been in a yeah. lot of the shows that I haven't been able to go to. And it's awesome. Even Evan last year was that girl power. I couldn't go. So like yep. I would call him stage dad, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Stay sad. Love it. Love it. Um, okay, cool. So now a couple more. Um, next one is going to be white fish in prep. Because I feel like this is you see this on a lot of meal plans. I I mean, there was that old stereotype that fish thins the skin, but fish or white fish in um in prep. Overrated, underrated. Underrated. Oh, underrated. Here's why. Here's why. Okay. My argument. Well, you go ahead. You say what you're going to say before I before I sway you. Me? Me or Lexi? No, no. Okay. Lexi hasn't said what she I'm, said. I'm a little bit... I think that the whole... I think people think fish is this magical food and I... So I think for that reason it's, it's a little overrated. However, I think that like reading into it, I think why a lot of people glamorize white fish in a prep or white fish in a fat loss phase is because it digests so easily for most people. Um, yep. that it helps with digestion compared to maybe something that doesn't digest as easily, such as like chicken, right? Um, so in that sense, it may digest better for you. So maybe your prep goes a little bit smoother. So that's why I'm kind of like in the middle of overrated, underrated. I'm like neutral. For it's me, it's lower. probably one of the easiest pr foods to prep that you can you can make it taste however you want. Whitefish is so palatable. You can season it. You can you can prep lots of it in a short amount of time. It's not, if you work in an office, no one's going to like you when you cook your lunch. Um, yeah. But, you know, one of my preps, like I would literally just go get, you know, white fish, season it, put it in the oven, put it in the, in the fridge. And I had food for a couple of days in a matter of 20 minutes. Like it's, so yeah, I think, I think there's been, you know, this, oh, your meal plan has white fish. You have a bad coach type of thing. But honestly, like, you know, uh, but but there's also other things like shrimp is amazing in prep. Mm -hmm. Like that is basically just pure protein, easy to prep, right? So it's not just necessarily white fish is underrated, but I think maybe light seafoods are underrated. Seafood. 
Yeah, look, you can toss in an air fryer and in like six minutes have it ready to go, which is really convenient. It digests well in the vast majority of people. It's also extremely low fat. If you get, you know, wild caught anything, it's going to be extremely low fat. Um, and it's the way that I've always judged the digestion on there. And I get this question a lot, like, how do I know if my digestion is good or not? Well, if your calories are a little bit on the lower side and you eat in an hour later, you're pretty hungry again. That typically means your body has digested everything through. So like, if you take something like, like fish and rice, here's the deal. It's going to be low fat. Now we all need fats in our diets, but that's going to allow you to be able to add good, healthy fats. So that will aid in your digestion, not a bunch of garbage fats, unfortunately that are in, you know, some of the foods that we eat today with it. So look, I think it's, um, I think it has its benefit with it, especially because a lot of people don't digest chicken the best these days. Um, and it's a very good alternative to something like chicken breast. Yes, I agree. I, I love seafood. I do. Um, and also I don't know if either of you guys have heard of this place, I know they're not like, I don't think they're in every state. I know they're in a couple of different regions, but wild fork. Mm -hmm. Um, have you, you heard of it, Evan? Yeah. Cause there's yeah, one, there's one sample. Yeah. Yeah. But it is such a cool concept. I mean, they sell a lot of seafood, they sell everything, but it's all frozen and it's pretty, it's priced pretty well, I think, but it's not, a, it's not that expensive at all. Like no. I went in there and got some food there a couple months ago. I was very surprised at the price. It was not, it's it was, bad. I would not consider it over. It's, it's not any more expensive than whole foods or anything like that. Oh gosh, no. And I mean, it's all frozen too. So that's nice. It's not like it goes bad super easily or super quickly. So, um, okay, now, cool. here's the thing though. Also fish, another good benefit to it is it's lighter. So you can actually eat more of it too. You can eat more of it. So like eight ounces, uh, typically to get a protein count in there, it'd be like six ounces of, of chicken. It'd be like eight, eight and a half ounces of, of fish so you're going to eat higher volume of it which is nice um so that's beneficial now one of the things is if it, it's high quality fish it can get a little bit on the pricey side of things with it so if you buy frozen fish which you absolutely do um places like Publix have them on sale quite regularly go stock up on that suckers and throw it in the freezer and then you don't have an excuse Actually, yeah, even whole foods has like certain days of the week where the mm -hmm. food's cheaper so you you can be economical with it Target actually has, um, I know this because I used to buy it all the time. They have a really inexpensive frozen tilapia that actually tastes really good. So, and they have baseball cards. Oh, well, then that's a win win right there. <laughs> Paul can we, get we, frozen we, tilapia and baseball cards. Now, that's one we need to do next time, not this time, is over already tilapia because I'll debate this all day long. Well, oh, we'll good. do that on another episode. Yeah. Oh, right. goodness. <laughs> well, we'll, do, we'll do two more because I know Paul has to go here soon. So, okay. This one is, I didn't, I didn't tell you guys this one before, um, that I didn't tell you this was on the list before we started, but I feel like, I don't know, I feel like you're got, you guys are going to roll your eyes at this one. So what do you think about the topic of like gut health and SIBO furthermore? I just feel like this is, so this is on the list because it seems to be a very common thing we're hearing about mm -hmm. like nowadays, a lot of times with competitors even. So yeah. what are your guys' thoughts on this? Like underrated, overrated? I, I feel like none of us are going to say like completely underrated, but I feel like it's definitely hyped up nowadays. Overprescribed. Can I say that? Yes. Yeah. No, I like that. That's probably no. what I would go with too. Can I, can I say this? I'll say this. If you're not going to cut it as a coach, I think coaches start to look at other avenues where they can bring in clients and they start to talk about things like you're broken. You have a problem. I'll help you fix it. Do you sometimes have bloating? Oh, that's a problem. Let me fix it. Do you sometimes get gassy? Oh, that's a problem. I can fix it. There's a reason why I don't talk about these things. A, it's such new science. I don't really even understand it. B, 99.9% .9 of my clients never have these issues. And I think a lot of it is self-induced by the style of prep you do. There's a reason why certain coaches have competitors that look great for a season, and then they have to take three seasons off. Um, and I think it's when you eat a very restrictive diet this is my correlation of course i don't have like proof of this but you know if you take a female competitor that eats the same foods a very low fat diet maybe low sodium diet probably low carbs and they do this for a long period of time there's almost like this self-inflicted change that your body goes through where yeah like you become susceptible to digestive issues um you start to have just real problems with 
with with digestion and you'll start to you'll start to look for solutions and it just so happens there's some coaches out there that are now talking about hey i can fix this stuff and it's almost like this wheel of like you go down this downward spiral and i've never really seen people go in there and come out of it and be like perfect i was fixed the only thing that fixes it is time it's 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 getting more flexibility in your diet, getting more ingredients that that do that. And I know you've had some success with it, Lexi. Um, so I'm I'm very happy for that. So I do think there is some valid science there somewhere. But the problem is the people that are practicing it right now aren't the scientists that I'm no. talking about. Yeah. No, well, these aren't like scientists. These, these are people that uh, unfortunately read some information on the internet and then are spouting it out to other people. These yeah. are not doctors. These are not professionals. These are not specialists. They're not. Well, these. I feel like most I mean, of them. I know I know a few people I can think of, like a friend in particular, a long time ago that I was talking to her and she's like, Oh yeah, I'm on a gut protocol. And she was telling me what she was doing. And it was basically like like keto and, and just doing all this like crazy stuff. And I was like, Oh, well, how did you know like you had gut issues? What were your symptoms? And she's like, Oh, I didn't really have any, but like my coach recommends that I do this. And I'm just like, okay. I like so I've I've seen that too, where people they're put in like gut protocols when they didn't even have any lingering gut issues before. Right. So I do uh, feel yeah. like it's, it's, it's a bit of a craze right now. Now, not undermining, like, you know, I think it is very much so a thing for some people, but I also find, and this is, you know, part of why I struggled so much with, with mine for a while was it's a lot of times it's stress induced too. Like these high, you know, stress environments that were in cr being chronically stressed that you know, especially when we're talking digestion, such as like maybe not going to the bathroom as frequently as you should. A lot of times it's not, you know, having to do with what you're eating. A lot of times it's just stress, chronic stress over time. And that's something that a lot of people don't want to have to deal with because it's not always the easiest thing to fix. But that I find fixes or helps digestion a lot of times too. I, I think for a lot of people too, it's especially after prep, people will have issues with it. Um, but think of it just like anything with prep. When you get done with prep, you just don't ramp your food up to 3,000 calories. You don't just cut all your cardio out. You have to slowly bring things back in that you have not had for a while. That's how the kind of life works. I mean, I know someone that literally just was had no issue with gluten, cut all gluten out of their diet for six years, and guess what happened? Now they're completely gluten intolerant because of that. Your body will adapt to things because yep. of that. It absolutely will adapt to it. It will. So knowing that I think is, is a helpful part of this. And a lot of these diets is literally just elimination diets. It's just elimination diets to find out what your body is not digesting well. Yeah. We all have, I think things that are inflammatory to us, especially as we age and things start to change. So paying attention to that is huge. You know, it took me a while to re realize for me, it was way um, and think I mean, when that happened, I, literally like a light switch went off. I was like, oh my gosh, I've been having this problem for so long and just ignoring it. Um, and then you just feel like a million bucks. But I think the, the real problem, like I said, I have is with the coaches or with the business practices that just convince everybody that they're sick or there's something wrong with them. I tend to focus on the opposite. You know, if some, you know, I've even had clients that were like, Hey coach, I'm going to go work for a few months with this person on a gut protocol. And I'm like, okay. And then six months later, they come back and I'm like, what'd you do? Oh, they had me on a, you know, no carb. I wasn't allowed to work out. I was like, oh, cool. How did it go? Nothing changed. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, okay, so you just spent time and money away from me uh, working on something and now you're back. And, you know, honestly, just getting back into a good routine resolves most of the issues. I'm not saying in this, I actually have friends that, that are celiac. They get pissed off. At like the influencers that talk about because that is a very real allergen for some people that it's like mm -hmm. life threatening or like it, at the very least you know um causes real problems marissa who works for us is is Sila. and she's she has to talk to the people about how they prepare the food on the surfaces like that's how level hers is so there there is very real medical background here but i think most of it is at least in our space you know, I talk about the continuous glucose monitors. I talk about the cold plunge. I talk, I think all of these things are like people looking for that next little solution. Mm -hmm. Just eat well, do some cardio, lift some damn weights, go to bed on time and just repeat. And that's going to solve 99.9% .9 of the problems. Agreed. 
Agreed, agreed. Well, okay, so I have one more and we're gonna end it up. We'll end it on this one since I know Paul has to go. Um and this this goes along with what we um we talked about at the beginning of this podcast. So energy drinks on prep, like carbonated drinks, uh, specifically energy drink, drinks in prep. Overrated, underrated, what do we think? As a negative impact? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. oh well. Underrated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, underrated as it possibly gets and, and until maybe until the very very end underrated yeah i mean i remember check my macros uh I, zero calories. Oh, i'm sorry I, I guess it would be overrated, overrated if we're talking about yeah. a negative overrated. right yeah. yeah it's like the way i look at it is some people cut out you know they'll cut out energy drinks diet soda so far out like in their prep and it's like to me that's just making it harder, like making the process harder than it needs to be. Cause I don't know about you guys, but deep into prep, sometimes like that one thing I look forward to during the day is that energy drink. Cause it tastes mm -hmm. almost like a, like a sweet, like just tastes like candy to me, honestly. And so if that's like the one thing that keeps you sane and it doesn't give you issues as far as like, doesn't cause excessive bloating. I don't see why you would need to cut that out like so far in advance. Now maybe yes, maybe cutting it out like a week before your show um, to dial it in, but I don't see an issue with them. I mean, I even just say like the last two days, just because of the carbonation, just replace it with coffee. But yeah, I, like you said, it's, it can have a sweet taste. It's got a little carbonation. It's got a little caffeine. It can help abate some hunger. Um, it can be a relief. Um, yeah. I, it's what, what, what was the question? Cause I said underrated because I think, you know, people, people think of it as not healthy because it's soda. Mm hmm and I'm the opposite. I think of it as like a lifeline. Well, and, and also not all energy drinks are created equally too. There are some that have far less ingredients in it that are far cleaner than other things are just like anything out there, yeah. anything out there. I do think energy drinks with less ingredients are going to be better for you because you can manage the variables better. There's some energy drinks. I think we've all been had these energy drinks that'll take it and they'll oh, start, yeah. they won't sit the best on your stomach. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. just because they're two for one. Like really buzzed. I'm telling you, Mountain Dew is missing the market. They don't have an energy drink. Like, I mean, they, I guess they used to bar one, but did they? They used to called Amped. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I mean, I but. think I, uh, I do think that some people take it a little too far, maybe deep into prep and they're having like multiple a day. And I mean, personally, I don't do that. I will, I limit myself like one a day max. I, Evan, I know you, you do more than that, but you can. No, don't... I, I do. I do one a day. I, I have oh, so I okay. sip on one. I sip on one literally all day long. Yeah. That's, well, that's... I'm the opposite. I'm probably having deep into prep four to six a day. <laughs> Wait, of uh, diet Not energy drinks, like diet energy. sodas. Just diet sodas. I don't really yeah. do energy drinks because of the caffeine content. I like to get my caffeine from my pre-workout. Like Core Fury is a way better pre-workout than a, a monster, right? Um, but yeah, I'll just, you know, especially if I'm traveling, because I don't I don't drink coffee though. So like Yeah. It's it, I, it, I think it all depends too. And, and if we have a like we have a large bikini audience here, here's the deal. You are not gonna reach you don't need to reach that level of peeled to the bone that that should ever play a role with it ever if you hold a tiny itty bitty little bit of subcutaneous water because of that it's not going to be enough to 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 see anything it shouldn't be at least but yeah removing the carbonation for digestion and for a little bit of bloating yes that can impact some people with that but let, let's let's be honest with this here on on some things matter and some things don't yeah. Well, Agreed. I think like what you just said, Evan, too, about how you sip yours throughout the day. I think if you are somebody who thinks you get bloated from carbonation, it's probably just because you drink it so fast. So just. Oh, and there are some that are less carbonated. That's one of the the, the Christian Guzman 3D. Uh, oh, Christian, I'm, I'm available. Um, Christian for sponsorship, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, the, the green one, it's kind of like a Mountain Dew, but the carbonation is so much less than a regular Mountain Dew. Sometimes I get that one because it's just smoother. Mm hmm celsius has a few of those as well that are pretty good celsius are also available low carbonated. So, you know we're free agents Celsius, 3d <laughs> you know we you were yeah the, the name of this episode needs to be shameless plugs for an energy drink I'm, I'm really sure they're all excited that we're completely <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> yeah. well i think that was a that was a good very relevant one to end on so maybe by the next week's episode we'll have picked up a an energy drink sponsor stay tuned let's go
Mountain Dew, come on, reach out to me. Oh, <laughs> All right. Well, anything, uh, any last bit of uh, wisdom you guys want to leave for today's audience? Wear a sunblock if you live in Florida. It's getting hot. It is. Yes. It's getting hot. My buddy, my buddy Ron, I posted a picture of his legs That's... yesterday. He just moved to Florida. <laughs> like Ron. Dude, what happened to it? That looked like. Oh he said God. he wore 50 SPF. And I'm like, dude, there's no, no he way you wore 50. It must have been expired or something. Because I saw yeah. that picture and I was like, oh, my God. That man lied to you. That man lied yeah, to you, Paul. Either that or it's like, yeah, it's expired. Or he went in the pool a couple of times and washed it off or something. But, yeah. Especially the tops of your feet. You know how much that hurts? Like the top of your foot? So here's um, the thing with me. I am a baby when it comes to horrible stomach viruses and sunburns. If I have a bad sunburn... I will not leave the house. I make a bleed baby with that. It's, so that I mean, picture your buddy had, that makes me, ooh. Yeah. They it's say that burn, I mean, and some burn would, would kind of qualify this. They say burns are like the one of the most painful things a human can undergo. So like I could, yeah, it's not fun at all. No good. Luckily, I'm Italian. I don't burn, baby. I just get gold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish. Send a little of that to me because I just burn. So that's why I oh, can't. Oh no, Lexi, I, yeah, you you are you are very fair. You're a fair maiden. I'm a dermatologist. Like, uh, I don't lay what out. is it? Cinderella? No, what's the Snow White? You're Snow White. Here you go. I'll go with that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for the uh, the great episode. I'm excited for this one for next one, and um, you guys have a good spring break. Yes. No school right. for you this week. Cool. Bye, guys. See ya. <laughs>